Hey, what's going on everybody? Justin here, and in this video, as you probably know from the title, we're going to be doing my April 2019 book haul. I know I'm still sort of a month behind, but the plan is to do the May book haul next week, hopefully, and then essentially I'll be caught up on the book haul sort of staple video because then I can do the June one at the beginning of July. So that'll definitely be good. Um, I acquired, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight books um, in the month of April. And what I do like about these eight books, even though it's not like a terribly uh, large amount, six of them are directly history related. So that is definitely really good. Um, one is outside, not maybe not outside of my comfort zone, but it's sort of an era, um, as you'll see in a little bit, that I want to start reading some more of, but I really just don't, I really just haven't studied it very much. So I'm glad to kind of start doing something a little like, you know, start reading about a topic that I haven't read before. Definitely uh, interested in that. And two of them are World War One books. I haven't read any World War One for quite a while. And it's definitely a topic I, tr I used to try to read about one every month or two, but I, I don't even know if I've read one this year. So I'm hoping I can dive into one of these two um, fairly soon. But let's just start with the two books that are not uh, directly history related. And the first one is Seamus Heaney's, uh, or Seamus Heaney's Beowulf, uh, probably the most well-known or popular translation of Beowulf that's out there in English right now. Actually, my friend Tim, I think he saw this at a garage sale for a dollar and he picked it up for me uh, because he knew I didn't have um, Heaney's translation of Beowulf, even though I got it like two copies floating around here somewhere else of you know more like literal translations um i'm not actually the biggest fan of uh what is kind of known as heaney wolf <laughs> sometimes in some circles just because uh the translator definitely took a little bit of poetic license with sort of his storytelling um and the way he translated uh Beowulf. it's still um a really good translation and for like readability and enjoyment it definitely probably is one of the best that's out there um but like i said i actually just never owned this edition of Beowulf, even though i probably should and now i do just because of its sort of um like almost historical importance as a translation so there's beowulf by here translated by seamus all right the next book is shark drunk and it's actually a book um ever since i had heard of it I was looking forward to it, and the subtitle is The Art of Catching a Large Shark from a Tiny Rubber Dinghy in a Big Ocean by Morton Stroxness. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, Stroxness, um, who is a Norwegian author in this book, I believe is also translated, or excuse me, translated from the Norwegian. And what I like about this book is essentially it's just like a story of uh, friendship and philosophy and culture and history all mixed together. Uh, what it's about is um, the author and like one of his friends who's an artist, uh, you know, he's either an artist or a poet or something, um, if I remember correctly. And he, they, the two of them sort of go off fishing in like this little tiny little boat up in the Arctic Circle uh, for the Greenland shark, which uh, I guess is known to uh, some of the, I, I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure the book will tell me, but part some parts of the flesh of the Greenland shark can like cause like hallucinations and acid trips. Basically, I guess um, I'm not exactly sure. But the 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 thrust of this book is actually more about sort of the culture of you know the archipelagos and islands uh, in the Arctic Circle that far north and just sort of philosophy and life and just sort of the oceans in general and everything. Um, just sounds really cool. And ever since I had heard of it, I think at the beginning of this year, I'd wanted to uh, pick it up and just to like read a little bit from the dust jacket. Cause I know that probably wasn't like the greatest uh, explanation ever. Uh, here is a little paragraph from the uh, dust jacket. Shark drunk is the true story of two friends, the author and the eccentric artist Hugo Azjord as they embark on a wild pursuit of the famed creature, uh, the Greenland shark, all from a tiny rubber boat. 
Together, they tackle existential questions and confront the possibility of the world's most powerful maelstrom as they attempt to understand the ocean from every possible angle, drawing on poetry, science, history, ecology, mythology, and their own sometimes intoxicated observations. Meanwhile, pursuing the elusive Greenland shark. Um, it just sounded like something right up my alley. I love nature books that combine sort of like history and science and kind of myth like all together. Just really cool. And that is something I'm really looking forward to. And I plan on reading it in the Book Junkie Trials next month. Yes. So those are the two books that are not directly history related. So let me go to the two World War I books. And the first one is The War of Attrition. Fighting the First World War by William Philpott. And the reason I picked this one up, um, it was on a really good deal. Uh, this author has written some other World War I books, though I've never, I haven't read uh, those ones either. But I picked this one up because I do believe um, that this book is going to deal a lot with sort of the logistical and industrial aspects of World War I, um, sort of the, the economic and social fronts, um, a little bit more than just this sort of. Um, uh, the political um, and military um, lens that a lot of World War I uh, books go through. And that's been something, uh, well, like World War I in general, is just something I've always been interested in reading about. And I don't have a book that tackles just sort of the industrial economic slant of the war as a whole. And like I said, like the logistical, you know, craziness of the Doomsday Clock, which is what uh, people called it back then, sort of the mobile, how... Uh, Everything was mobilized, especially at the beginning of the war, down to like literal seconds and every single train had to be just on time and this and that and this and that um, with plans and counter plans against uh, uh, enemy forces and everything. So I thought that was really cool. And then obviously when the war wasn't over in December of 1914 and people started to realize, you know, we have to dig in and this is not just going to be over uh, and it's going to be a long drawn out affair, just sort of how the nations of the world sort of logistically just like industrialized to the capacity that they did, that they did is mind-boggling and that is why I wanted to read War of Attrition just so I understand that aspect of the Great War a little bit better. All right next up is another World War One book and it's The Unsubstantial Air American Flyers in the First World War by Samuel Hines and I didn't know anything about this book except it was cheap and it was about obviously American pilots in World War I. Um, I don't have, I don't think I have any books directly related to just um, uh, the airmen of the Great War, but it definitely sounded like something uh, really interesting. Obviously there's like this huge mythos with, you know, the Knights of the Sky, the Knights of the Air in World War I, especially around um, like the Red Baron, uh, Richt uh, Eric von Richthofen and stuff, um, especially on the uh, German side of things. But there definitely were a lot of, you know, aces there. Like I said, there was kind of a mythos about people read about, um, you know, these uh, fighter pilots in the air or in the newspapers and everything. So there was, um, like I said, there's sort of just a big kind of legend that surrounds this whole aspect of the war, even though it wasn't terribly instrumental. I, I don't want to say it was unimportant, uh, but compared to the other um, aspects of the war, the... Uh, the fighting in the air was definitely one of the, I guess, lower tier. Um, I don't know how to, I, like, I don't, like I said, I don't want to say that it wasn't important, but it definitely wasn't, I guess, as important as a lot of the other aspects, like the logistical stuff um, in the infantry and the artillery and everything during World War One. Uh, but like I said, there's sort of this grandiose mythology behind, uh, you know, these fighter pilots going up. You know, with their goggles and scarves and everything and all these like wooden propeller planes um just a really they're just really cool stories um it's interesting too so i just wanted to learn uh more about them all right let's see so that leaves four more history books i'll go to the one that's a little bit out of my comfort zone not like terribly so but the one i was kind of hinting about and it's the house of medici it's rise and fall by christopher hibbert and what i wanted to do was read a book sort of about the renaissance because but not directly on the renaissance if that makes any sense <laughs> um usually with my history reading like once i hit about the 1400s and 1500s that's sort of where i trail off and i don't care as much unless it's like world war one or something i just you know like i'm not really big into like american history or um 
think early modern history in general. But I want to start changing that a little bit. And so, I, like I said, I wanted to find something on the Renaissance that wasn't, you know, directly only Renaissance related. Uh, so I went with the House of Medici because I know um, the dynasty of Medici in Florence. Um, even that was sort of um, a big engine behind the whole movement of the Renaissance and, you know, uh, bringing out the patrons that were paying for, you know, all these people like Leonardo, Michelangelo and stuff. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I didn't want to book directly on just, you know, the Renaissance in general. And I'm hoping this will get me familiar with some of the big names and even some of the kind of like, uh, more medium names uh, around the era of the Renaissance. So when I read other books, I'll understand it a little bit better just because I only have kind of like a vague rough sketch of the important things of the Renaissance and don't really know much about sort of the details kind of going on behind the scenes or the lesser known facts and figures of, of the Renaissance. So I thought this one would be a really cool one. Uh, plus the, from what I do know about the Medici's is they were not, I don't want to say just scandalous, uh, but very just sort of extravagant and decadent. And I think it'll be, uh, it'll make for some entertaining reading during the Renaissance period. So that's why I went with the House of Medici. And this one had uh, good ratings out of the couple ones that I saw. So that's why I picked up Christopher Hibbert's uh, book on the Medici's. All right, uh, another modern issue book that I picked up that I didn't, I guess for some reason, I just didn't realize how big this book is, um, is The Bully Pulpit, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft and the Golden Age of Journalism by Doris Goodwin. Um, I do know this one, the Pulitzer Prize, as you can see right there, which is always um, a really good sign. And um, along with World War One, Theodore Roosevelt is sort of a little um, era of American history that I really enjoy reading about. Sort of the guild, the end, the second half, like the Gilded Age from like say 1890 to uh, like you know World War One is an era I do uh, read a little bit about, and I've read several books on Theodore Roosevelt, and I definitely want to read some more. So when I saw this one, I picked it up. And like I said, Theodore Roosevelt is just a really interesting uh, figure, not just politically, but historically as well. And that's why I sort of gravitate uh, towards Theodore Roosevelt for like sort of American history things. And like I said, I wanted to read one. So when I saw the bully pulpit, when I found out it was, you know, a Pulitzer Prize winner, I'm like, you know, that's definitely got to just be like one of the ones I got to pick up. And then when it came in the mail, I was like, um, what is this? And it's like 800, well, 800, it's 700 something pages. And then like the notes go on into the 800s. So yeah, I'm not exactly a hundred percent even sure what it's all about, to be honest, besides I obviously it's going to be about sort of the, the muckrakers and the journalism and stuff of that age, but I'm not really sure what all 800 pages are going to be about. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. Um, I'm hoping it's written well. I didn't, like I said, I didn't realize quite how long the book is going to be, but I will definitely give it a shot at some point. All right, and that leaves two more um, history books. And I actually went with some classical history just because I didn't do so well last year with my classical history reads. Um, so I'm going with Rome and Empire Story by Greg Wolf. I saw that it had some good reason, uh, reasons, some good ratings. And I, I, at first I was kind of thinking, you know, what do I need another sort of general just history of the Roman Empire? Uh, but from the... Um, the advanced praise that I saw on one of the websites uh, was Adrian Goldsworthy and Tom Holland, which are two very respected uh, writers and authors on, um, especially Goldsworthy, uh, in my opinion, uh, is just, those are, like I said, especially Adrian Goldsworthy, that getting praise from him is a real good sign. And I just kind of wanted to try it out just because I haven't read a gen I only read one history of Rome, like, you know, general history of Rome last year. And that was SPQR by Mary Beard. And it was okay, but I didn't think it was really anything uh, special. So I just went with Roman Empire Story because of the readings that it had. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it turns out better. The dust jacket was sent upside down for some reason. Don't really ask me why. Uh, but like I said, I'm hoping it's just a nice, concise history of, um, I believe, from the age of Augustus, maybe Julius Caesar and the age of Augustus, to the end of the empire. And, you know, you just can't, you can't, really, even if it's a bad book, you can't really go too wrong with the history of Rome. It's always just uh, entertaining reading, usually. And then the next book is a book on Byzantine history, uh, which is 
the Eastern Roman Empire, and especially after sort of the fall of the West, um, I lived on as Byzantium, and we're going with Justinian's Flea by William Rosin, Plague, Empire, and the Birth of Europe. Um, this is about um, a lesser, most people have heard of the Black Death that swept over Europe in the 1300s. Uh, most people don't realize during the uh, mid uh, 500s or 6th century AD um, or CE, uh, the Black Death uh, had come at that time as well, and essentially did the same thing, wiping out, you know, a third to half the population of, uh, and uh, especially urbanized, or industri uh, not industrialized, urbanized uh, Europe, especially in the Byzantine Empire, uh, which was the major cosmopolitan uh, region uh, in Europe at the time. So yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to uh, look at the 6th century in the light of this plague. Um, and actually, that is so part of what caused Justinian's uh, problems later in his uh, uh, tenure as emperor. Um, of course he did, the manpower resources were drained so heavily, um, it you know drained the tax base. Obviously when you know a third of your population dies, that takes out a lot of uh, manpower out of the economy. Plus he had the Ostrogothic Wars, um, especially the fought, uh, fought in Italy uh, for well over a decade. Uh, it definitely caused sort of these crises in the Byzantine heartland um, in the mid sixth century. So yeah, I just think it'd be an interesting read uh, just to kind of complement other books that go on the Black Death in the um, high middle ages in the 1300, yeah, 14th century. So yeah, just, I don't know why I just said you. So yeah, like it always seems like every video I have a little phrase to kind of uh, stick with. But yeah, it, <laughs> of course I say that just as I do it again. Uh, but anyways, like I was saying, this is the Black Death, the f probably one of the f early. Uh, there, there is some sort of uh, consensus too that the Athenian, Athenian plague at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War might have been the Black Death as well. Uh, but if that wasn't, this was definitely the first major strike of the Black Death in Europe. So there you guys have it. Those are the eight books that I picked up in the month of April. Uh, if you've read any of the authors or if you read any of these books, uh, leave some comments down below. Tell me what you guys think of them. Um, and if you have some kind of cool um, history recommendations sort of on the Renaissance era, you know, the 1400s and 1500s especially, if you have any good books uh, during that time period that you think would have a unique slant that I would like, definitely leave some comments down below as well. If not, also just let me know what your favorite book from April uh, that you picked up was and tell me uh, what you guys thought about that one. Always love chatting with you guys about book recommendations and everything. Uh, but always remember, whatever you ended up getting in April, whatever you read in April, always remember to keep reading victoriously.